of the DMH DD Technology Summit. My name is Holly Reif. I'm the Provider Relations Specialist for Assistive Technology, and we are excited to have you join us this morning for this morning's keynote speaker, Dustin Wright. He's the founder of the Disability Cocoon. As a reminder, this will be recorded and added to our Technology Summit page after the summit is complete. Some upcoming event re reminders, APSI will be I'm sorry, we're having a little technical difficulties. Holly got um, booted off for a second, so give us one minute. Okay, so Holly is um, trying to get back on and we've got a lot of information to cover up. Oh, there she is. All right, Dustin, we're, we're ready for you to start. Okay, wonderful. Um, glad to be here with you guys. Uh, my name is Dustin, Wright. Um, obviously with disability cocoon as Holly said, as, and as you can see on the screen, um, <clears throat> Here, I'm uh, actually based in Indiana, uh, sitting here looking out my window at about 10 inches of snow. So excited that we're doing this virtually so that I can still be here with all of you and uh, talk tech. So um, we're gonna get into the, the why tech is important, who needs to be involved in this movement, what are we, you know, what when we say tech, what are we talking about? Some kind of best practices on how to begin to implement technologies. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with some three simple steps. Um, we will have plenty of time at the end for questions. So if you, as I'm talking, please jot those down and um, we'll get to those at the, at the end of the presentation. So real quickly, just a little bit about me. So, you know, my, my background, um, I started in this industry uh, about 20 years ago as a DSP, uh, loved it. Um, honestly, didn't have any real idea what I was getting into when I took the position. I was a college kid at uh, Purdue University here answered an ad in the newspaper. That's back when we used to advertise in the newspaper. And uh, oddly enough, the office of this company, uh, this DD provider was across the alley behind my house. Uh, so I went down in the basement of this group home, had an interview and uh, didn't, like I said, didn't really know what I was getting into, but really fell in love with the field and loved my job. Did it my, my entire college career. Once I graduated, I ran that agency for three or four years. Uh, left there in 2006 to start Rest Assured, which is a remote support uh, provider that you may have, may have heard of. Um, as the executive director there for 13 years, I realized that, you know, there was tech, there's a lot of tech out there. And uh, the only resource that was available to people were the state AT Act programs. And I felt like there just needed to be another resource, which is why I created Disability Cocoon, to try to pull together all the tech that we're seeing but also to uh, help establish best practices based on my experiences at Rest Assured. So that's me, that's what kind of brought us here today. Um, you'll notice that I'm, I'm extremely passionate about the impact of technology in our industry um, and excited to kind of share with you some really cool things today. So as we start looking at, at technology, and for some reason my thing always does that, whenever I start sharing screen, let me get back into the presentation mode here, back this up. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is why technology, you know, why, why should we as an industry look at this, you know? So I'm going to start with a really big hypothesis and that's obviously a hypothesis is a guess. So this may or may not come true, but I'm fairly certain that it will. Um, for those of you that have been in the industry um, in, in, or have heard of how services were provided in decades in the past, what, prior to the waiver system, Individuals with disabilities largely lived in institutions, in large congregate institutional settings. Um, as the waiver system uh, you know, was created and people had the opportunity to move out into the community and have their own homes and live their own life the way that they wanted to, people involved in disability services were extremely scared, um, worried, how, are the, how is this person gonna be safe? They don't have this institution anymore. We're not gonna be there. It's gonna be different. They can. You know, they were scared because it was change, right? 
But obviously we know that the waiver system was an amazing thing and fundamentally changed how people with disabilities receive services and supports um, now in the community, right? My hypothesis is that technology will have the same impact on how we provide services to people, but more importantly, the, the quality of life that the people that we're serving receive. So tech, the tech revolution will be our generation's kind of deinstitutionalization movement. And I hate to put it in those terms, but yeah, I think you understand kind of what I'm saying is that it's gonna fundamentally change um, how we provide services. And, and I think it will be for the better. It will be for the better. Um, you know, it will become the new norm. And we're starting to see that as many of the states, uh, including Missouri, have their technology first initiatives. They're seeing the impact that technology can have. They're organizing and creating resources and tools to change the culture and change the mindset within the community so that tech is no longer this anomaly that's a strange thing out here that we're doing. It's now brought into the box of, uh, you know, the normal services that we provide. It is changed though. Right? It's a change in how we do things somewhat, and it's going to be scary for some people so that those those organized efforts are, are very, very important and applaud Missouri for what you guys are doing there. More funding options are becoming available I can tell you when I started rest assured the again, rest assured is a remote support company uh, based here in Indiana. When we started that in 2006, <clears throat> there was 1 state funding remote supports, Indiana. That's it. Um, over the last 20 years, we've seen. Uh, there's 20 plus states funding it now. States are getting very creative, especially with COVID, right? Uh, the uh, appendix Ks that states had opened the floodgates for technology. So if there is one, I guess, kind of silver lining in COVID uh, from a tech perspective is that it did force us all to get creative and creative more quickly than we would have. Um, and And we, we created immediate funding options for technology, which was amazing uh, to see how, how that worked for some folks. Uh, you know, there's also, um, we've talked about this in every conference, every presentation hits on it. You guys experience it every day. I know my wife runs a service provider uh, here in Indiana, and she's on a call right now talking about DSP shortages. I'm sure it's on your agendas as well. Technology is a tool. It's not gonna be the, you know, the, the uh, magic wand that we wave and all of a sudden our DSP shortages is solved, but it will be a very, very, very powerful tool in using those human resources that we have more effectively and more efficiently while improving, um, you know, the lives of people. So, uh, especially with the remote supports, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We're also seeing that uh, workforce expectations are changing. So, and when I say that, you know, most of the most of the target labor that we're pulling from is of a younger generation. And there's obviously there's a mix, but vast majority are younger generation based on the wages that we can pay. Um, those folks have grown up with their phone in their hand, communicating, interacting, socializing, living. I hate to even say it, but living their lives on the device. And if they walk into an organization or an industry like, like ours that hasn't embraced how technology can be woven into people's lives, it's gonna seem, our industry is gonna seem completely foreign and antiquated. So as we embrace technology, I think that we will become a more attractive industry to those younger generations as, as you know they become our primary targets. Um, tech will also help us refocus what we do more on the person, right? So <laughs> I hesitate to do this, but I'm gonna be a little bit vulnerable. Um, I, I told you I was a DSP uh, and I worked in a, in a group home. There was eight, eight people, four guys, four women. And um, I worked the morning shift. So it was me and, and several other staff, but I was typically one of the only males working. So I had four guys to get up, get ready, help them get ready in the morning, you know, get out the door, go to work. Well, you know, I was also, as I was helping them get ready, I was responsible for teaching skills, right? The skills that were a part of their ISP. Toothbrushing, bathing, grooming, those were some pretty typical, you know, how to shave, how to take your medicine, typical goals that I was helping people to learn as we went through that morning routine. Well, 
the morning, we had to move pretty quickly through that morning routine. Uh, so as I was teaching those skills, it was almost impossible for me, and maybe other people are different, but it was almost impossible for me to count and memorize, oh, it took David three prompts to get the toothbrush and, be and begin brushing his teeth. It took, you know, Jim two prompts to, to uh, you know, adjust the water and test it before he gets into the top. You know, those, those, there's no way. I, and honestly, at the end of my shift, I was just looking and doing my service documentation, kind of like, okay, yeah, that was about three. So my point is that um, tech will allow us to kind of refocus, stop thinking about all these um, documentation and compliance things and let's really focus on the person and let tech help us manage those other aspects, you know, regulatory compliance and that, that stuff that is very, very important. I'm not saying it's not, but tech will help us really focus more on the person and uh, the support that we're providing to them. It'll also give us more data and insights to the example that I just gave. The data will become better. We'll see that it was actually two prompts that for David to brush his teeth. We'll get better data and data that we haven't had also. I think that as homes become smart, we'll have patterns and routines that are identified using uh, you know, artificial intelligence and algorithms, and you'll be able to look in and get an immediate alert if a, if a uh, process or pattern in the home has changed. It'll just give us a lot more insights so that we know and we can prepare and plan to better support that person. Um, obviously, uh, we're an industry that we're not manufacturing, right? We're not creating a part. We're supporting people's lives and supporting people to reach their dreams. And because of that, as an industry, we don't really look at efficiency a whole lot, right? Meaning that we're not trying to squeeze out every hour of, you know, and cut margins and or increase margins by a fraction of a cent on each piece. We don't focus on efficiencies like other industries like manufacturing does. But tech will help us become more efficient, serving more people with the same amount of funds or, for, again, using those human resources more effectively so that we can become more efficient with what we have uh, and, and, and have a more positive impact. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to pause <laughs> kind of intentionally here. And everything that I have said, all those other reasons, forget about them. I mean... Seriously, just put them to the side. DSP shortages, more data, better um, supports focused on the person. Well, maybe don't forget about that one. But uh, my point is, if we don't do this one, if we don't focus on outcomes first for the person, which is person-centered planning, right? What is your goals and dreams? If we don't focus on those things first, and we get what I call shiny object syndrome, where, hey, there's this great new tech, let's go use that. Where can we use it, right? If we focus on the tech and not the person, this is not going to work. And we will not get the outcomes that I just described. If we stay focused and do what we do, person-centered planning, focusing on the person's dreams, desired outcomes, focus on the person, build tech around that and for that and for them, then we will see the benefits of tech that I was describing. So that's why I think tech is important. And um, it's also important as we go through this cultural change towards this new era of tech enabled supports and services that we are intentional in ensuring that all of these roles are involved in this kind of process that we're going through. And I, again, applaud Missouri for the Tech First movement because they are doing this, organizing information so that all of these stakeholders have access to the information that they need. They understand why we're doing this. They understand where to go get resources and things of that nature. So it's very, very important that all of these folks and all of these stakeholders are involved in, in this process as we, as we push this forward. So that's kind of why tech we need to embrace it. So when we say tech, what what types of technology are we actually talking about? Um, there are many different types that we're going to go through here, um, but they all 
kind of fall underneath this umbrella term that Tennessee created called enabling technology. Um, I've also heard it called supportive technology in other states, but it's an umbrella term that says this is any form of you know, device software technology that um, improves a person's life and helps them live as independently as possible. So enabling technology includes assistive technology. It includes technologies for smart home. It includes remote supports. It includes any form of technology that makes a person's life better. So we're going to talk about all of those different things, remote supports and assistive technology, but kind of wanted to just throw that umbrella term out there. So when we say enabling technology, it's all forms of technology. So let's dive in here and look at a few different examples. Uh, the first one that I want to kind of look at here is um, uh, smart home technology. And there are, obviously, you can go, you know, walk out into or Best Buy or go to Amazon and you can buy any type of smart home device. There's so many on the market today that, uh, you know, can be used. But there are some that were intentionally created uh, for our industry and for the people that we're serving. <clears throat> One of those is Simply Home. Um, and basically what they have is an array of devices around the home, as you can kind of see here on this image in the middle, motion sensors, stove sensors, uh, door and window sensors, various other devices that are detecting activities in that home. If they detect something that is deemed um, potentially dangerous or you know, out of the norm, that would require intervention by a staff person, the system will actually give the individual an automated prompt, which is what I really like about this, is that it's not just these sensors pushing an alert out to somebody remotely, right? It's not remote supports because they're not pushing these alerts out to somebody else, and then that person, that human being is intervening with the individual. What they're doing is they're setting this up and then the system will give prompts to the individual automatically, allowing that individual to self-correct or to deal with the situation themselves, teaching autonomy, right? Um, now, <clears throat> if the person doesn't self-correct, they, they leave the stove on as an example, the system can push an alert out to someone else through an app that they've created um, to, you know, uh, so that, that a human being can intervene. Uh, they also do a lot of uh, home automation, meaning that they can uh, set up environments where, um, you know, people that lack uh, the dexterity to press buttons on a TV remote control can control their TV in other ways, control lighting, things like that. Um, kind of a different spin on the smart home environment is this company out of Florida, <clears throat> and actually I think they're in Texas also, uh, called Home, home Smart Assistant. Uh, they have not created any technologies. <laughs> what they do is kind of consulting and configuration of smart home devices. So they go out and they meet with the individual and their team, and they're really focused kind of on the aging market, but they are doing some stuff for people with disabilities. Where they go out and they sit down and they look at, hey, what are your desired outcomes? What are we trying to accomplish for you? Again, starting with the person, not the tech. They look at the person, what do we want to accomplish? And then they make recommendations. Oh, well, I think that we can, you know, we need this app to control your television. We probably should do a smart thermometer, you know, thermostat, et cetera, et cetera. And then they help with the, the setup and configuration of all of those and installation of all of those devices in the home. Uh, you know, as if any of you have ever done the smart home thing in your own home, you know that you're connecting, you know, your, your base unit, whether it's an Apple or um, Amazon or whatever, your base unit, you're connecting it to all these ancillary smart things and it's connect this app to this app to this app and then configure this and, you know, it, it, it is somewhat complicated. Uh, so they, they come help with that process is what they do. So uh, great, great tool and resource there. Lots of tech out there for medication administration. Um, one that I want to show you is Dose. And I really like this one because, um, mostly because of its size and, and simplicity, but not too simple that it doesn't have some key features. Uh, meaning that, one, as you can see, it's, it's, it's actually pretty small. You can't see the scale here on the screen, but it fits in, in your hand. It's you know, that big around. So it's very portable. Um, has a cellular chip in it, has a battery in it. So you know, the person, if they want to go take it to work, 
throw it in the backpack, it'll continue to work and dispense medications for them. It's portable and mobile. Um, it is secure, meaning that you know, the person can't get in and get access to any other drugs. Uh, it's smart in the fact that it can push alerts out to people if medications are missed, et cetera. Only drawback on this is it is, does have a pretty limited capacity, so it does have to be refilled um, frequently, and they have um, trays and things of that nature to, to increase the capacity, but uh, really great device. And there's many, many of those on the market today. Uh, Livy, um, you, you'll find them. If you just Google automated med dispenser, you'll see a bunch of them. Um, this one is a little different, and I really like this, this model. The dispenser itself is not much different than what you would see with a typical med dispenser. Um, the, the difference here, and this is done by Terrapin Pharmacy um, out in Maryland. Uh, they're a closed-door pharmacy where they package drugs and ship them out to service providers and to the individuals that they're serving. Well, what they've done is they've created packaging and a device so that when they package the drugs in the pharmacy, they ship them out and then they're, the package is designed to fit inside this dispenser. So you get the package, you put it in the dispenser, a few button clicks to program it, and it dispenses the right drugs for the right person at the right time. There is a little call feature. So if an individual, and the individual can self administer this, they just walk up hit a button, I think there's a passcode for them or some way that they validate that, you know, it's the right person. They get their drugs. If the person has a question, there's a little video screen that connect them, that they can connect with somebody live um, that isn't there. Um, and the, so I really love just the concept of connecting the pharmacy directly to the dispenser, because then you don't have the, the you, you know, the potential human error of taking pills out of packages and dropping them into these you know, little slots. It's, it's just, uh, again, one way to remove that, that human error component. Um, lots of tech out there also for um, helping people through various activities of daily living. Um, I really like this one. Uh, Createability, uh, they're based here in, in Indianapolis, about an hour south of where I'm at. Uh, they have an app called uh, MeMiner, which you can kind of see on the left here. And it is a simple task prompting app, uh, meaning that you know, the person can learn how to shave by little short prompts uh, that go in sequence, how to take the trash out, how to feed the dog, how to make spaghetti, whatever it is. <clears throat> but as they're doing that, it's not just this routine that's canned, meaning that the team has customized this so that when they're getting these prompts, it's pictures of their home, pictures of their, if they're making spaghetti, pictures of their pots and pans, of their stove or the knob on their stove. So it's very personalized and customized to, to, to their environments so that it's, it's super simple for people to follow these simple steps through. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell a, a, an example that the, the CEO of this company, when he was speaking at a conference somewhere, I heard him talk about this and I just absolutely loved it. There was a uh, a, warm, a woman that had um, didn't want staff in her home in the evenings and, and during the overnight. She had no staff during the overnights, but she had staff in her home until about 10 o'clock p.m. And then they would leave and she'd be alone at night. Well, she wanted some alone time while she was still awake prior to 10 p.m. So they wanted to back that up to staff leaving just after dinner around 7 o'clock. So you know, they didn't go the remote supports route and, and set up the whole home with remote support technology. <clears throat> what they did is they they identified that really the only thing that was a uh, desired outcome for her was to be able to make popcorn for herself. She did it every night and <clears throat> staff would assist. She lacked the dexterity to press the buttons on the on the microwave effectively. Well, they they created this task prompting app to teach her other steps to, you know, put the popcorn in the microwave, press the buttons, showing her pictures of her microwave, and <clears throat> giving her a tool where she could manipulate the microwave. Well, the first night went great. She made her popcorn, had a great night, perfect. She followed the app, they could see, the team could see that she actually used the app by looking at the data behind it. Well, <clears throat> night two, 
she was putting the popcorn in and instead of hitting three minutes, she hits an extra zero on the microwave and put the popcorn in for 30 minutes. Well, obviously there was a the popcorn caught on fire, smoke billowing out of the microwave into the home, smoke detectors going off. She was scared. Not a good situation, right? Well, <clears throat> what the team did, and, and this is the reason I'm telling this story, is I like the team's response. They didn't immediately go to what we do. I shouldn't say this. What a, a common response would be is, oh my gosh, technology doesn't work. She can't do this. We're putting her at risk. This technology is not going to work for her. That's one response. The team didn't do that. What they said is, hey, where was the failure point? Obviously, she was using the app. They could see that she was using the app. The failure point was that she just couldn't manipulate the buttons effectively and reliably on her microwave. So what they did is they got an Alexa-enabled microwave, and all she had to do was say, Alexa, make popcorn. Well, then they went back into the MeMinder app, updated the prompting routine, and instead of pushing the buttons, now she says, Alexa, make popcorn, and it makes popcorn for her. So long story to kind of explain that when you implement technologies, you're never going to hit it hit the nail on the head 100% of the time and have perfect implementation. There's gonna be bumps. That's what the team process is for. We go back, we look at it, we modify what we're doing, we modify the plan, we modify the technologies and continue to work towards maximizing independence that way. Um, so love that example. Another piece here uh, about technology, and I really wasn't planning on talking about this, but um, we always have to have a backup plan um, for, you know, when tech fails, because it will, right? I mean, we're starting the conference today, and Holly, hate to take to pick on you, but when we were starting the conference, Holly had an internet issue. She can't control that. Her tech failed. Well, somebody was there to back her up, and, and there was a backup in place so that we could continue this conference. Same thing with tech. You've got to have a backup plan in place because the technology will fail. I mean, how many times do you have to reboot your modem? How many times do you have to restart your computer? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. So here's another really interesting example of a task prompting app. So it works very similar to the MeMinder where it gives that individual step-by-step -step instructions on some activity of daily living. What this app is a little bit different, the way that this app is a little bit different is it almost brings in like a remote support component to that. Meaning that as the person is going through that live and in real time, somebody remotely can be watching their progress in real time. So, and also you can set up alerts to go out if a person gets stuck on a specific step or they stop using it during the routine. Alerts can go out to that remote person who can then come in through the app to assist the individual, um, you know, with that human interaction component. So that's kind of a backup, right? If the person isn't using the tech, the tech isn't working for the person, the backup is they have a built-in backup of a live connection to a human being that can be there. So a uh, really cool tool. It's, you know, again, it's almost like a blend between in, using an app and remote supports. Um, and we're going to talk about kind of that blend of remote supports in other areas. Lots of tech for transportation as well. Um, a couple really amazing things here. Um, I don't know if you guys, Missouri is actually a state that well, where Carepool is, is providing services, but it's kind of an Uber for people with disabilities. Um, it's inclusive, meaning that they do give rides to other folks besides people with disabilities, but that's their primary focus is on uh, having, you know, ride share available to individuals with disabilities. And what they've done is a little different in that they try to keep the same driver with the same person. Uh, based upon that person's routines so that, you know, the person um, gets to know the driver. The driver is trained on how to support people with disabilities. It's not just some, you know, random citizen showing up uh, and, and they make sure that they have a ride uh, in a vehicle available that is, you know, going to meet that person's needs, whatever they are. Another really amazing tech um, transportation or community community navigation app is uh, this Wayfinder by AbleLink. 
And it, it, it's kind of like the task prompting apps in that it gives people step-by-step -step instructions on how to navigate their community, whether that's walking down a street, whether that's uh, you know walking down the street to get on their bus and get the right bus and go to work and get off the bus at the right bus stop. This app gives those prompts along the way using the GPS and the phone to track the person's location. If they get off course, it can push alerts out um, and, and make sure that that person is following the prescribed route to get to where their desired location is, whether that's work or recreation or whatever, it will you know, um, help them to get there and, and track their whereabouts so that we don't have to worry. Uh, okay, um, so those were some examples of various forms of enabling technology. Now, when I said enabling technology, I said that it also included other forms of tech like assistive technology, which it does. So I wanted to kind of describe the fundamental difference between typical you know, assistive technologies and remote supports and other forms of enabling technology. Assistive technology is a device, a software, a component, a program, whatever, a product, that the person uses themselves to improve a functional capability. So those are kind of the two key things. The person uses themselves to improve a functional capability. So with remote supports, that's not, it's not assistive technology because a lot of the times that that technology with a remote support system, the individual doesn't use. It's used by a remote staff person to support the person. Uh, so that is a key piece of assistive technology is that it's used by the person. And there are several different examples here that we can kind of go through. And let me see if I can get this full screen again. Sorry, I didn't realize I didn't do that. Um, here, <clears throat> an amazing tool here. Um, I think they're based out of Germany. But uh, they have created a way to allow people to control power wheelchairs by using these smart glasses. So if the person isn't capable of manipulating controls, uh, typical controls on a powered wheelchair, they can use these glasses, nod their head back and forth, or even move track eye movements to help. And those movements of the slight head movements and eye movements allow them to track, uh, uh, to, to move the wheelchair to whichever way they want to go. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, this is kind of just a little silly thing here. Uh, Zoom has uh, has incorporated uh, automated uh, closed captioning. So um, I'm sure the WebEx probably does that. Uh, Teams, um, we're starting to see these big platforms have that included as well for those folks that can't hear or low hearing, etc. I'm not going to play that video. It's embedded there, and I should have said this that there are several videos that I'm not going to show just for time that are embedded in this presentation. And, and I can get this to Holly and she can share it if you guys are interested. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've talked about uh, several cognitive forms of assistive technology. One of those being that MeMinder app with the popcorn making example, where again, the person is using it and it's helping them with cognition. So. Various different examples of that. We also see lots of tech um, to help people control the physical environment uh, from, again, we've talked about controlling televisions, lighting, thermostats. We see robots that can vacuum our floors. Um, I was actually, a little personal note here, building a bridge across the creek in my backyard the other day and was at Menards and I saw a, uh, a lawnmower that is like the iRobot. You know, it's an, it's an, autonomous lawnmower that drives itself around your yard, just crazy. There's also, you know, a very various other different things out there to help people control their, their physical environment. Um, lots out there for vision, screen readers, text, speech, magnifiers. That's pretty common stuff. Everybody's, you know, very familiar with that. Uh, and, and for communication, there's a couple of really kind of game changers from my perspective. We've all seen the communication boards that uh, folks that can't verbalize what they'd like to say use to communicate expressively um, their thoughts. Um, you know, those boards are great, amazing, but that is their board, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's one device that they take with them everywhere. And if it breaks, malfunctions, 
they can't speak until we get a replacement because the, the, the board is the technology because the software is all on the board, right? Well, CoughDrop has kind of changed that where they've created a cloud-based app that basically you log into, like you do your Facebook account. You can log into Facebook on your phone, on your computer, on your tablet, in the library at the, you know, wherever you're at. And that's how CoughDrop works. It's a cloud-based communication board that you can then use on whatever device. So if the person wants to go to, to work and use this, they can take it on their phone. If they're at home and they've got a tablet attached to the wheelchair that they want to use, they can use a stair. And it's the exact same app across all these different devices. So um, really great. And then, you know, if your iPad breaks, you get a new iPad and just log back into your account. Um, really a big, big, big game changer. Um, if you haven't heard of Voice It, it's, it's huge. Um, so basically what, the, what Voice It is, is individuals with, with non-standard speech patterns. It's difficult for them to communicate with these smart speakers, right? Like Amazon Alexa, et cetera. Um, I'm sure we've all done this as you're communicating with your smart speaker, you know, hey, Alexa, do this for me. And you were chewing or something and she didn't understand you. And she said, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Well, imagine being a person that can never communicate with those things because they aren't smart enough to understand those non-standard speech patterns. What Voice It has done is written algorithms and software that can learn those non-standard speech patterns so that a person with a non-standard speech pattern can communicate with their device, which opens up the smart home environment for them that they otherwise would not be able to. Voice It also has an app, so if the person just wants to you know, take their phone with them and they say what they want to say, Voice It hears their voice and puts it out into the world in uh, you know, a voice that could be understood by somebody that's as they're ordering food, right? So it, it, huge game changer here. They're based out of Israel um, and uh, they're really well funded. So we're going to start to see that use more and more environmental controls. We've talked about this lighting doors, using the smart speakers, uh, vehicles where you can control um, you know, uh, individuals that lack uh, the ability can, can use adaptive vehicle controls to drive, et cetera, et cetera. We've all heard about the autonomous vehicles. When that occurs, that's just going to fundamentally change uh, how people with disabilities are able to drive a vehicle, even people with cognitive disabilities, uh, using, you know, again, probably some of those task prompting things. You get in a car and, hey, step one is I push this button here. Step two is I push this button here and say, I want to go to work. And step three, push my seatbelt on, right? And then go. <laughs> Then the car goes, I don't know how it's going to work, but well, I think that will fundamentally change things for folks. And then tech is also being incorporated into parts of our life and, and people with disabilities life for recreation and leisure, right? Um, I don't know if you guys saw it two or three Super Bowls ago. I can't remember what it was. Uh, Microsoft, you know what? I'm just going to let this one play because this is so good. If you haven't seen this commercial yet, um, just buckle down because it's pretty, pretty powerful. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen. And I am nine and a half years old. So Owen was born with a rare genetic disorder called Escobar syndrome. He's had 33 surgeries to date. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. What I like about the adaptive controller is now everyone can play. They will just say, all right, that's that button, that's that button, that's that button. Perfect. One of the biggest fears early on is how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> it's not different when he plays. No matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. So that video uh, was a commercial uh, run during the Super Bowl by Microsoft. 
um, and a minute long commercial. So you know how much that costs, right? Well, they're Microsoft, they can afford it. But what it shows is that big tech, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, et cetera, they're realizing that as we create these tools for society, that we have to incorporate principles of universal design so that more people can use our technology. I think they're probably two sides of the coin, right? Big tech, they're focused on profits. They want to serve more people, make more money. But I also think that there is at the core, they're realizing that we can't exclude some populations just because it's inconvenient for us. We need to be inclusive, use principles of universal design. So it's exciting to see big tech getting involved. That's really where I think we're going to see some massive changes once that big tech really recognizes the population that we're serving um, and that they can have some you know, major impact on the quality of their life. So, all right. So another um, kind of pause there for a second and transition. Uh, another form of enabling technologies is remote supports. And I'm sure uh, being from uh, Missouri, you guys have heard about this, talked about it, maybe are using it right now. Uh, and there's really two different types of uh, remote supports that we're seeing today. Option one is um, a local service provider hires or subcontracts with a vendor, right? Meaning that they, the local provider doesn't have to develop the technology or do the supports. They're having somebody else do that for them. The other model, which is rather new, is kind of a DIY model where the local provider can actually start providing remote supports themselves. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but I wanted to kind of hit that there are several different companies out there that you can work with, several different models of remote supports that are available. It's not, there's not just one model of remote supports. Uh, as you can see here, I've got my descriptions of how I look at them. Um, and the first is what I call active support. And this is uh, live real-time oversight from a start time to an end time that remote caregiver is, is getting sensor alerts from the home, using cameras to watch video in real time in certain areas of the home, uh, communicating and prompting that person is needed. But it's real time from a start time to an end time that remote caregiver is engaged and observing and getting alerts that entire time. Um, this is a very popular uh, service when people first start using remote supports as teams are somewhat hesitant to maybe not have staff, so let's have as much oversight as we want. Other individuals may not want that level of support. They don't want somebody looking into their home. Uh, they don't want, <clears throat> you know, to be watched while they're cooking in their kitchen or sitting on their couch in their living room. That's when this other model comes into play, which I call passive reactive, where you still have all those sensors in the home and the cameras potentially in the home, uh, but they're, the cameras are off and sensors are on and looking for abnormal activities or activities that would require some intervention. If something is detected, then the remote caregiver could turn those things on and, and observe real quick, give the prompt, shut those off so that the person has the privacy that they want. So it's kind of like a more passive monitoring until something happens and then we'll react. Somebody is reacting, the remote caregiver is reacting. Remote supports can also be done for just simple check-ins. It doesn't have to be for these hours on end. You know, if the person only needs a med reminder at 5 p.m., just do a quick check-in at 5 p.m. Kick the system on, say, hey, it's time to take your medicine. How's your day going? Great. I see you took your meds. Have a good evening. You know, real quick check-ins like that can occur also. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing. And I was weaving in some logos here of some of the vendors, and I'm sure that you guys have seen uh, many of these in, in your area. Winreath is based out of Ohio. Uh, but there are, the last I counted, about uh, 18 remote support vendors around the U.S. right now um, that are providing remote supports. Uh, the other option is if the local service provider doesn't want to subcontract with a remote support vendor, they can use technologies off the shelf to do this meaning that that local service provider can go to Best Buy and buy these devices, integrate them together. It probably will require some uh, writing of software and it's pretty significant effort, but it can be done. 
uh, to do it right, though, there, there are some learning curves and obviously some safeguards that have to be in place that uh, are, it would be a significant barrier for those local providers to be able to do that themselves. Time consuming and expensive. Who has time to do that right now, right? Who has time to build a remote support system? We can't, we just have to go get staff. That's you know, kind of where we're at. But there are some platforms out there, uh, Simply Home and this next gen, that were created intentionally to give the local service provider all of that tech without them having to build it, giving them the tech and the knowledge and the training and support on how to do this. Full disclosure, I'm a co founder at Next Gen, um, but again, just wanted you guys to know that it, you know, Next Gen is not the only one. Simply Home, you can do kind of a remote support uh, model there, and you can just go get stuff off the shelf. So, for those of you that are local providers, I would really encourage you to. Um, Kind of look at that model. Uh, you know, I think it's a good model in the fact that it's not this distant person doing the remote supports. And and again, I ran one of those distant companies. They're very good. I'm not saying that they the very person centered. They have all the services they provide are around the person's needs. The remote caregivers get to know that individual, but they're not local. They're not you. They're not involved in that person's life on a daily basis like you are as a local service provider. You as a local service provider could have a much more intimate form of remote supports. Um, so there's also, um, you know, I think that we're we're kind of getting into another area of enabling technologies. That's I'm going to call it enabling technologies because I think that these tools do help to improve the independence and autonomy of the people that we're serving and improve their lives. Even their, their, their provider solutions, I mean, tech that providers are using to manage their business or how they deliver services, those types of things, they're improving the lives of people with disabilities. We all have one example of that are these electronic health records, um, whether it's Therap, Metasked, you guys may have something that you, um, uh, you know, designed for the Missouri system there. Um, they're great tools. Uh, the one that I really, really like is Connect a Voice. And the reason I really, really like this, if you go back to my my vulnerable moment when I was describing that my service documentation as a DSP might not have been the best. And it wasn't, it wasn't always like that. I don't want to make it sound like I was a terrible DSP, but it is what it is. Um, in that example, I was somewhat kind of, you know, guesstimating the number of prompts that occurred. Well, Connect a Voice is an EHR, but it can give the staff person the ability to use their own phone to do service documentation. Meaning that as I was back there giving, you know, helping David and John and Joe and Tim with their morning routines and giving them prompts and teaching them those skills, instead of me having to remember all that stuff, and go document it at a kiosk in the you know, kitchen or the office in the home. I could have had my phone running the Connect to Voice app and said, hey, David, three prompts, toothbrush. And it would recognize the voice, log it in a secure way that then goes into the, you know, the cloud EHR. So giving us better data documentation right at the time of service delivery, which will give us better data. So I love these guys. They're based out of Ohio. Um, but I think they are providing services uh, nationwide. Um, some really great communication tools that are out there also for providers. And I really, really, really like this one. Um, for those of you that are service providers, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of steal their CEO's part of his presentation. So here's, this is what he says, the, the CEO of Quillo. He goes, you know, for those of you that are service providers out there, I want you to think back to your last five interactions with DSPs. What were they? And his point is that as executives and managers and directors, a lot of our interactions with DSPs is corrective actions, retraining, which is good. It needs to happen. I'm not saying that, but that's, that's all they hear. And as a former DSP, I can tell you that, you know, when I saw my supervisor, it was training. It was not, it, it, and I never saw like the CEO of the company when I was there. Um, so what Quillo has done, sorry, kind of stumbling all over this, but what Quillo has done, they've created this app 
that executives and CEOs and vice presidents and directors can use to push content and communications out to the entire organization to help their workforce feel connected and inspired and engaged. And it can be just recording themselves and sending in a, you know, a short video out through almost like a social media type app that Quillo is um, to, again, you know, help engage those staff members, give them some positive, you know, hey, thank you all who pitched in and helped during the storm, you know, the snowstorm last month. It was, you made sure that the people's lives that we're supporting were first and foremost, and thank you. You know, that kind of communications can be powerful. Quillo also has several other, you know, kind of educational videos that the, you know, managers can choose to push out. So Quillo has created some content, and this is just funny to me, but like, you know, what color is your pee? It's a little short video that can teach a DSP, hey, if you see urine that's this color, or this color, or this color, this is kind of what it can indicate. So giving them really short chunks of training, again, to improve uh, the lives of the people that they're serving. Nucleus, um, if you guys remember in the 60s, 70s, there were the intercom systems in homes. That's kind of what this is, but 21st century version of it, where it's not room to room communication anymore, it's home to home communication or office to home communication through this two way video screen. Um, and the reason I'm showing this is I've seen providers use this during COVID to create social um, interaction opportunities for the people they're serving, to connect that person with their peers that live in other homes that they can't go, they weren't able to go see. So it's just a great way to stay connected. You know, as a DSP, if I had one of these things in the home and back in that day, I was picking up the phone and calling my supervisor if I had a, a question, but having this to be able to, you know, talk to my supervisor if necessary would be, would have been great. So there are some things like that out there that are, are again, kind of provider tools that will help, um, I think, improve the services that we're providing. I wanted to talk a little bit about training and education um, as we're, we're going to kind of transition into, okay, so what do we need to do? If we know why tech is important, right? We talked about that. We talked about some really good examples of types of technologies that are out there, and we just scratched the surface, honestly. Uh, but now we're going to get into kind of how do we do this? What do we need to do to become more tech progressive? And one of those is training and education. Um, I was lucky enough to be a part of the creation of Shift. Now, I, I also created Disability Cocoon. Go there. We've got a bunch of stuff that um, that we were doing. Um, kind of slowly ramped that down over COVID, but going to continue to. Um, scale it back up, got some plans on hiring a few people, but again, we've got a lot of resources there. I don't want to, you know, be too self promotional there, but an amazing tool, uh, that I was lucky enough to be a part of creating is called shift. Uh, and it is a, an online learning management system to allow to teach professionals, uh, agencies and down to DSPs and service coordinators. The fundamentals of um, implementing technologies in a person centered way and, and to allow those professionals to go through a series of courses that teach them, hey, how do I do an assessment? Uh, how do I do a tech assessment? Here's the tool on how to do it. How do I go from this assessment to incorporating what we determine we need into creating a tech plan? How does the tech plan become a part of the ISP? How do uh, as we as an organization, what policies do we need to have in place? What infrastructure do we need to have in place as an organization as we start to use more technology? So it's a really great training tool that kind of gets into those nuts and the bolts of really how to do technology in a person-centered way. Last bucket here of other types of tech that I'm going to hit real quick, um, telemedicine. Um, if you guys haven't heard of Station MD, I believe that there's a project going on in Missouri, so you probably have. Um, they are basically a dock in a box, for lack of a better way of saying it. Uh, there's a kiosk in a home. Uh, staff or the individual can walk over, hit a button, and be connected live to a real doctor. And these doctors are 
only serving individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities. They have access to their medical records so they can have a you know, virtual appointment on demand, basically. Uh, their real uh, goal is to avoid um, unnecessary emergency room trips so that you can get the advice that you need. Do we need to go to the emergency room or not? Again, back to my DSP days, man. When I was working in that home, that um, one of the homes by myself, um, you know, I have three people's lives in my hand that are some, some of them are somewhat medically fragile. I'm a college kid. Yeah, I know they're ISPs. I've been trained on how to deal with this, but I'm a college kid making split second decisions. Is this symptom that I'm seeing normal or is this outside the range of normal? Having a doctor there in a box where I could go walk over and hit a button and say, hey, I'm seeing this with this person, what should I do? It would be, it would have been such a peace of mind to have that in the, in the home. And I've got a video here that you can see uh, of them. Lots of telehealth solutions. I like this one from Creatability. Uh, so telehealth is collecting, you know, health information um, on an ongoing basis that is then reviewed by someone remotely. And the way that Creatability is do doing this through their pumped app is they've got this little avatar that will pop up and ask questions of the person and the person can answer those so that the person isn't having to put, you know, the blood pressure cuff on or you know, that kind of thing. They're simply answering questions about symptoms and how are you feeling and what's your weight and that kind of thing and a really simple interface so that people with intellectual disabilities can, uh, can do that. Uh, this is kind of interesting. We all know uh, how Alexa works, right? Or Google Home and those types of things. Well, obviously when you talk to it, it's pulling information from everywhere. <laughs> what Wellby has created is a smart speaker that you can customize for your agency or for the people that you're serving. So you know, one of your um, the individuals that you're serving in one of your group homes can say, hey, Wellby, what's on the menu for dinner? And it'll pull, obviously you have to upload the menus that you're gonna be uh, you know, cooking or those types of things, staff schedules, et cetera. But these speakers can then can be customized to really give the individual information about the supports that you're providing to them. Oh, oh we do have a few more and man, there's so much tech. I just keep, I keep, uh, Forgetting that we were going to talk about these, um, but this one is is pretty amazing. This is uh, called Ira, obviously, um, designed for people that are blind, low vision, um, and it's I'm calling these things here remote X because they're not remote supports, but they're more than assistive technology. So if you look, think, go back to the definition of assistive technology. It's a device that the person is using to improve a functional capability. Remote supports is having a staff person or a support at a distance. These are kind of a blend, honestly, and, and there really isn't a category that they fit neatly in yet. Um, Ira, uh, again, designed for people that are blind, low vision. Um, you can see this guy, he's got these glasses on. Uh, he's blind and these glasses have a camera built into them and speakers built into them. And it's connected down to his phone when and he has an ira agent so ira has a call center or support center if you will that they then remote in look through the camera in his glasses and give him prompting in real time to navigate the community they also have this available through an app so you don't have to have the glasses um but just, it's pretty amazing. I actually had a, I was at a conference and I saw there was a woman there that was kind of doing a, uh, a demo of it. And this blind woman was nav navigated her way through the conference without using her cane. They do recommend that you still use the cane, but um, navigated through the maze of exhibitors out into the lobby of the hotel by just keep getting prompting from this IRA person. And the app is completely free including the use of the IRA agent. I have no idea how they're funding it. If you want the glasses, I think those are paid, but um, just an amazing free tool. Uh, and then there's also these other uh, kind of smart uh, devices that are quasi 
remote support kind of not remote supports in the traditional sense, but remote X is what I'm calling it. Um, this is just a smartwatch that can detect seizure activity um, or detect irregular movements that are associated with seizures. Uh, I, I don't think they have the FDA clearance to say that it's an actual seizure detector, but it, it's a seizure detector. Um, collects the data, pushes an alert when a seizure occurs. So if you've got, you know, even staff that are in the home, but not maybe not back in a bedroom with the person as they're sleeping, they don't have to be going in there every 15 minutes, opening the door, waking them up to see if they're having a seizure. The watch the person has on can tell them if there's a seizure occurring. It's also going to record the data of the seizure so that uh, you, know, you can take that data to the neurologist. Again, better data for better outcomes and better treatments for the person that we're serving. Wow, so that was a lot of tech. Um, again, we can make this presentation available to you so that uh, you know you can go back and and explore some of the videos that I skipped through and and kind of look uh, for the thing that interested you the most. But I'm sure that there was probably some tech that you're like, wow, that's great. We could use this for John and Jim and Sally. And I want to again pause and kind of give you a word of caution that. Don't focus on, don't have the shiny object syndrome. Don't think, oh, that's so great. We could do this here and there and then. Go to the person, focus on their outcomes, and then find solutions that can meet those outcomes. So how do we do this? Um, how do we do this tech first change? What it takes to make it? Missouri's doing it, so I could probably just skip these slides, but I'll go through them anyway. Uh, because Missouri uh, DMH has done such a great job with their technology first initiative. Um, it, it, it requires change and they're having tools and have created tools to help with the cultural part of change. Right? Um, so we, as an industry. Are very regulated <laughs> uh, and because of those regulations, which are important. We have these very strict lanes that we have to operate in and tech is kind of stepping out of those lanes somewhat, which will require call. It's a cultural change that, hey, we, as an industry, we can step out of this lane a little bit. Look, we can do it. Um, so, cultural change is something that I think Missouri has done a great, great thing on. We also, you, all of us need to stop perceiving that we are, hey, I'm a social worker. I'm a Q. I'm a. Whatever your title is, I'm not a tech person. I don't know how to do this tech stuff. Stop thinking that way because this is really, again, not about tech. It's person centered planning and using new tools to address needs of people. It's, I was putting, doing something the other day and I said, you know, tech is not a new method of support. It's not, we're not moving people out of an institution into a waiver home, they're in their home. <laughs> This is a new tool to provide service, the same services and the same methods, but using different tools. So you know this, you know how to do disability services. Stop thinking that you're, you can't do this because you're not a tech person. I'm not a tech person. Um, so one of the things, you know, go, go get some training and resources. Shift again is an amazing one. One of the things that within shift that they recommend is that your agency form a tech champ or have a tech champ or form a tech team. So, again, talking to service providers, but this also works for service coordination, uh, even down to the team level. Have somebody in the team invite somebody into the team that knows tech. That's a tech champ. Um, your organization can create a committee that drives policy and change and meets regularly. Uh, to talk about tech and how do we incorporate tech into our agency and the services and the lives of the people that we're serving. So I'd really recommend that you kind of formalize that. You don't have to go hire anybody for this. It's just utilizing people that you already have. Uh, definitely share your success stories. That's how culture changes, right? Hey, I did this. Somebody else hears it and they're inspired by what you did. Also, share your failures, right? Share the times when you burn the popcorn in the microwave and it's totally failed because we also everybody else will also learn from those and it's not failure it's your first attempt at learning right um 
So share, share, share as much as you can. That will help with the cultural change. Missouri's done a great job with policy. Um, you, know, pop, you know, the policies and, and reimbursement structures there are, are written in a great way so that you can take advantage of all of the forms of technologies that we've talked about. So I kind of skip through this part here because uh, you, Missouri's DMH doesn't need a lesson on this. They've, they're, they're doing it. Funding is available. You know, I would also encourage you to look outside of the waiver programs. Um, yes, waiver funding is the primary funding source for tech in most states, but there's other stuff out there. Grants, um, there's um, loan programs through your uh, state AT Act programs. I'm not sure if Missouri's has the loan program. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, voc rehab, there could be some funds, so go explore. Um, what funding is available that you could draw down using ARPA funds, uh, et cetera. So go, go explore, find some other funding options. And I would really recommend that you be intentional, right? Meaning that um, tech needs, to, we need to be organized around this. We need to create those internal tech teams. We need to uh, share our success stories and our failures. It needs to be on everybody's agenda. Um, as we're providing services in, at, at all levels. One of the things that Ohio is recently about ready to do, it's not out yet, it's out for public comment, is they've got a tech first rule that says in the person-centered planning process, you have to show that you've looked at remote supports and other forms of technology prior to your residential services being authorized. So it's, it's that intentionality of saying, hey, we're going to look at tech because it could be the least intrusive form of support for that person and the best form of support for that person. We're going to look at it first. It may not be right for that person, but we have to be intentional and look at it first. Um, I also think that we need much more research on around this in our industry. There's some some studies that have been done. Um, lots of anecdotal kind of success stories that are, you know, you can hear and it's working, but we need some really solid research around this. And I don't know who's going to do that, but it needs to happen. We need to be innovative. We always need to be in discovery mode. We need to be looking for new solutions and new ways to do things. <clears throat> That's not just tech. We have to be looking at tech, obviously, because uh, it's going to be evolving so quickly. But we as an industry need to be innovative. How can we make things better? Um, we need to make our industry known to big tech, right? Um, look what Microsoft did with their adaptive game controller. <clears throat> what else could they create that we haven't even dreamed of yet or Google or et cetera? And somebody has to go first. So if your agency is not using any form of technology, maybe you could be the person that starts this and you could be the person to go first in your agency, or you could be the person to first recommend this in a team meeting or somebody has to go first and we need leaders somebody that's willing to step up and kind of stick their neck out there and say, hey, we should do this, be intentional. So <clears throat> all that said, um, here are three simple, simple steps that I usually recommend to people. One, form a tech team. Again, multidisciplinary team of people that it's their agenda and their purpose to discuss tech, to plan for tech to find resources, those kinds of things, to make it a part of what your organizations do. Go find some resources and learn. Go to your state ATAC programs, look at SHIF, look at Disability Cocoon, whatever, and then start. And it doesn't, you don't have to start big writing policies and you know doing all this stuff. Just start, find one person, one person and one outcome that you can change, that, that they want to change, and then go find a solution and do the one implementation. That one implementation will teach you so much about how to implement technology uh, in a person-centered way. So with that, um, <clears throat> I appreciate the time today. Um, and I know that I threw a lot of information at you. I hope I wasn't talking too quick. As I said, I get so excited about this stuff that I just start rambling. And uh, I hope that you also couldn't hear my wife working in the background uh, in the other office. So um, but with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, see if there are any questions. So we don't actually have a lot of questions in the chat. So I would encourage anyone who has a question for Dustin or would like to 
maybe have him go over another piece of the tech um, to, to speak up now. Um, Dustin did mention a lot of things that we are doing within the state through our technology first movement. So that was really exciting. I feel like we're already like in the driver's seat. We just gotta, you know, keep moving forward. So um, if there are any questions? And if there aren't any, we'll, we'll take a bio break before our next session starts at 1030. Give it just a few minutes here. It might be typing. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Dustin. I, I've always enjoyed your, your presentation. I'm glad you were able to share it with us today. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be a part of it and um, hope that you all enjoy the rest of the conference and stay warm. Yeah, you too. Well, we're, we're just getting a lot of thank yous and a lot of love in the chat, which is always a good thing. Um, but I don't, I don't see any questions. So we'll just go ahead and sign off for, for now and um, if we do get questions later that um, we can't answer through our technology first initiative, I'll reach out to you and, and maybe pick your brain on those. Happy to. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. All right.